as I say, I've, I've always been a fairly lousy employee, you know, I just tend to don't like people telling me what to do, you know, I like to do it the way I like to do it. So um, what happened there was I just, I answered an ad in, in uh, Music Week and it was for label manager for the Rolling Stones. So I thought that sounds good. So I went up, Mick himself did the deed. He was, I'll never forget this interview. He was literally, the guy can't sit still, you know. He was on his feet all the time. There was a table in the middle. He was walking, strutting around this table, <laughs> asking me questions, walking around like he was on stage, you know. It's amazing. He was good, I, I, he was a good bloke though. Anyway, I got the job, so. That was, I did that for, again, about two and a half years. I can't seem to last any longer than about two and a bit years in most jobs. Again, at the beginning, before they'd started, I'd actually started work. The first record I worked on was the Get Your Yaya's Out, which was the last Decca, Decca album. So, uh, and I helped them get that tongue logo and stuff. You know, I happen to know John Pash, who was working at Christmas, I think he was working at the time, but he was doing freelance work as well. I don't know why I chose him, what, what happened, but anyway, he came up with this logo, they loved it. There it is, another icon. <laughs> John Pash was a guy, he's, he's famously known for having done it. We, we just paid him a measly fee for doing it as well. It didn't seem like anything at the time, you know, it was just something to stick on the label, <laughs> just to make it look like something instead of just a blank yellow label, you would just stick a, this logo on it. They wanted something to go on the label, they hadn't even got the name by then. I mean, they'd just end up calling it Ronnie Stone's Records, which was a fairly bit of a cop-out. We had long lists of names we wanted to call it, you know, proper names, but nobody could decide on anything. That's why they never really signed any acts. They were supposed to be signing acts and, you know, making a record label out of it, proper one, but they could never get that together. They just, I mean, they had a half a million dollars, I seem to remember, was on the table there to sign acts with, and. They could never decide anything, so they just took the money and <laughs> shared it out amongst them. <laughs> Bugger that. I think John went back in after I'd left, and they, and they did actually have the decency to pay him some more. I don't know how much more. <laughs> I wasn't there, but uh, the other only interesting thing there was um, finding these tapes in there. They had a rehearsal studio down in, in Bermondsey that Ian Stewart was in charge of, and all their equipment was kept there and stuff. And they used to rehearse a bit there. And, in the corner, I noticed a whole pile of multi-track tapes, you know, I thought, what the hell are they? You know, they weren't even marked properly or anything, so uh, I asked Mick if I could just take them down, you know, Olympic Studios and just put them up on the board, not mix them properly or anything, just put all the faders up and make a rough mix, you know, and stick it on cassettes. I mean, that's what we used to listen to in those days, cassettes. So I, I waded through all these tapes and sent them all cassettes and... Um, Sure enough, there was some good stuff on there. The, the ones they picked ended up on Exile on Main Street, so uh, that's been fairly well documented now, and you can tell which ones came out of that pile of tapes. There was stuff that they just, I don't know, I guess they had too many tapes in Olympic and they just had to take them out or something, I don't know, anyway. That was quite good, because they got extra money for a double album, which I thought, so that's paid my wages, so. <laughs> I walked away from there in a fairly decent frame of mind.